And final preparations are underway for the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, scheduled for liftoff in just 30 minutes. They will include a study of the atmospheres of the Earth and Sun and the first untethered spacewalk by U.S. astronauts in 10 years. Stand by for our live coverage in about 20 minutes. NASA stopped the countdown clock at nine minutes because of nearby stormy weather. If the weather improves, and we've got live pictures right now, the launch could go ahead within the next three hours, and we will provide live coverage when it does happen. Hi, I'm John Holloman. NASA mission managers at the Kennedy Space Center say that they're about to restart the countdown clock for the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. Today's launch has been delayed by several hours because of thunderstorms in the uh, Kennedy Space Center area. But you see the countdown clock there. The winds are there. The skies are becoming clear. And the sun is again out. And if the countdown clock starts when NASA managers want it to, about 45 seconds from now, the shuttle would lift off nine minutes after that, about eight minutes after the next hour. CNN will, of course, be here to provide live coverage for you. And coming up on CNN, The World Today, which is next. The Space Shuttle Discovery is scheduled to begin a nine-day mission today. CNN's John Holloman has the latest on the shuttle launch. Judy, the launch has been delayed for more than an hour because of some afternoon thunderstormy weather in Florida. We can look down at uh, launch pad 39A there, and you can see the shuttle on the pad right now. There's a little haze caused by high temperature in the area. And um, at, the, at the present moment, everything above the, the launch pad is go for a launch in five minutes from now. The countdown clock is stopped at T-minus five minutes and counting. And the only reason the shuttle, that clock isn't ticking and the shuttle isn't in the final few seconds of its countdown is that there is the possibility of a thunderstorm brewing over the shuttle landing strip there in Florida. Here's a, a weather map, a radar weather map from CNN's Weather Center, and you can see that um, the Kennedy Space Center is virtually clear of the heavy storms, the red and yellow storms that were over the Space Center about an hour ago. So the situation is moving in the right direction, according to NASA's launch manager, Bob Seek. And uh, what will probably happen in the next couple of seconds is that Seek will give the astronauts the word to power up the final systems on board Discovery for a launch I'm anticipating sometime later in this half hour. When that happens, we will be here to bring you the launch live as always. Bernie? Thank you, John. Be back to you very, very soon. And coming up, live picture, the shuttle launches in its final countdown. You see it, T minus four, 10 and counting. Also, we'll have the latest on the baseball strike in a moment. following is CNN's coverage of a live event. The Space Shuttle launch team is holding its breath in the final few seconds of Discovery's countdown. Last month's attempted launch of Columbia was aborted at the last instant. Managers hoping the equipment on this most complicated nice piece of moving equipment ever built by humans will all work perfectly. There you see the countdown clock. We're in about a minute to go for launch right now. The countdown from launch pad 39B has gone smoothly so far today, although there's been continued concern about the weather in Florida. The goal of this mission is to study the atmosphere of the Earth from outside it using a laser gun to bombard the atmosphere with various colors of laser light. There's a telescope aboard which will pick up the pictures and interpret how much pollution there is in the atmosphere as well. In the final 30 seconds, we'll listen to NASA commentator George Diller as he counts the shuttle down to the launch. T-minus 31, Discovery's computer is now controlling. We're into the auto sequence, T-minus 25. 20. T-minus 20. Sound suppression system activated. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Main engine start, three engines up and burning. Two, one, liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, developing new techniques to monitor our Earth's environment from space. Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Discovery. Houston now controlling. Discovery's rolling on course for a 57-degree inclination, 140 nautical mile high orbit on its 19th trip to space. Discovery speed already 400 miles an hour, altitude 9,000 feet. 
three engines on board Discovery now throttling back to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure. Discovery now going supersonic. Speed now. 1,023 miles an hour, four miles east of the launch pad. Altitude is 47,000 feet. Discovery, go with throttle up. Go with throttle up. Three engines on board Discovery are now back at full throttle. Good hydraulic systems, good electrical systems on board. One and a half minutes since liftoff. Discovery's already burned more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant and weighs less than half of what it did at launch. Flight controllers now be standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Discovery's altitude now 108,000 feet, 16 miles east of the Kennedy Space Center. Speed now 2,700 miles an hour. There go the solid rocket boosters, meaning that the most dangerous part of this flight is over. The shuttle is flying up the east coast of the United States right now, and depending on weather conditions where you live, if you live on the coast, you might look out over the ocean and actually see these solid rockets as they come down, and the shuttle as it goes on up the coast, it'll get almost as far north as Washington, D.C. before it goes, um, you know, out of your field of vision. The shuttle launch is scheduled for afternoon this time rather than morning so that particular sites on the ground will be below the crew at specific times. In addition to the atmospheric observer that we talked about, the crew will launch a satellite from the cargo bay to examine the sun and the ring around it known as the sun's corona. This satellite will record what it sees and will be picked up and returned to Earth by the shuttle for processing. But the most exciting part of the mission will come one week from today. Two astronauts, Carl Mead and Mark Lee, will fly around the cargo bay unattached to the shuttle. They'll be wearing new backpacks, which are supposed to propel them around the cargo bay. It's part of an astronaut rescue system. Well, we've managed to, um, th to rewind the launch itself to let you see that as the shuttle continues to uh, pass out of view. We'll go and we'll look at the launch one more time for the final couple of seconds. Have a look. Six, main engine start. Three engines up and burning. Two, one, liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, developing new techniques to monitor our Earth's environment from space. Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Discovery. Houston now controlling. Discovery's rolling on course for a 57 degree inclination, 140 nautical mile orbit on its 19th trip to space. Discovery speed already 400 miles an hour. Altitude the big event for people down here on Earth during this shuttle mission will be the spacewalk out in the cargo bay by those two astronauts. They'll be outside for six and a half hours. And as I said, for the first time in about 10 years, astronauts will be able to test these backpack units, which are much lighter, much uh, less expensive to manufacture. And uh, then, then the earlier spacewalking outfits, uh, the man maneuvering units, they are called. But uh, at this moment, as you're looking at a replay from a couple of minutes ago, I'm still looking at a live picture from NASA, which shows that the shuttle is up several hundred miles, many hundreds of miles away from the launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. And we're told by NASA that everything continues to be going very, very well as it gets uh, into its position of orbit. The shuttle will be orbiting about 160 miles above the surface of the Earth for most of this mission as they send these radar pictures back down to Earth. And now you're looking at the live picture from the Kennedy Space Center that I've been looking at. It's amazing that they have cameras that are this good, that you can see this thing from this far away. Our coverage will continue through the nine or ten days of this mission. But for now, that's what it looks like. The latest from the Kennedy Space Center and from CNN on the shuttle launch. John Holloman, CNN reporting. This has been a CNN Live event. Cape Canaveral mit sechs Astronauten an Bord ist in der Nacht die amerikanische Raumfähre Discovery in den Weltraum gestartet. 
Es ist der 64. Flug in der Reihe der Space Shuttle Flüge. Insgesamt neun Tage lang soll sich die Mannschaft der Discovery im All aufhalten. Nach Angaben der NASA ist unter anderem geplant, mehrere Experimente zur Erforschung der Erdatmosphäre durchzuführen. Die US-Raumfähre Discovery ist in der vergangenen Nacht mit sechs Astronauten an Bord ins All gestartet. Gewitter und Regen hatten das Abheben vom Raumfahrtzentrum Cape Canaveral um zwei Stunden verzögert. Während ihres neuntägigen Fluges soll die Mannschaft auch Experimente im Bereich der Umweltforschung durchführen. Dabei werden zum ersten Mal Lasergeräte zur Beobachtung von Umweltschäden und Wetterverhältnissen genutzt. Geplant ist auch ein Weltraumspaziergang zur Erprobung eines neuen Rettungssystems für Astronauten. Abheben zum 64. Flug eines Space Shuttles. Mit sechs Astronauten an Bord ist die Discovery ins All gestartet. Neun Tage wird sich die Mannschaft im Weltraum aufhalten und zahlreiche Experimente durchführen. So soll unter anderem erstmals ein Lasergerät zur Beobachtung von Wetterverhältnissen und Umweltschäden erprobt werden. The US Space Shuttle Discovery has rocketed into orbit after a two-hour delay caused by bad weather. Discovery and its six astronauts plan to spend nine to ten days in space, examining the atmosphere of the Earth with lasers. There will also be an untethered space spacewalk to test a new jetpack. Meanwhile, two Russian cosmonauts have taken a five-hour walk in space to check for wear and tear on their Mir space station. Mission officials later declared the walk a total success. A European space launch was less successful. Officials of the Paris-based Ariane Space say the Telstar 402, which had launched from French Guiana for the U.S. communications company AT&T, was lost shortly after being placed into orbit on Thursday. The satellite was to provide voice, video and data transmission in North America, Mexico and the Caribbean. AT&T says the mishap is under investigation. The mission got underway Friday and just hours later the six-member crew powered up a laser to study the Earth's atmosphere. Also on the agenda are experiments on robotic manufacturing. And next Friday, the first free-flying spacewalk in a decade. So nördlich von Venezuela hat er sich aufgebaut, hat etwa einen Durchmesser von 800 Kilometer und könnte sich auch noch zu einem Hurricane entwickeln. Das war's vom Wetter. Ihnen einen schönen Abend. Tschüss. Hearing jet and a laser machine designed to focus on the Earth's atmosphere. The laser has already already detected tropical storm Debbie in the Caribbean. The astronauts are on a nine-day mission and should return to Earth in a week. Now, CNN's John Holloman spoke via satellite with crew members on the shuttle just a few minutes ago as the shuttle crossed from the Pacific over South America and then over the Atlantic. We're joined from space today by Discovery Commander Dick Richards and Mission Specialist Jerry Linninger. Gentlemen, uh, the first thing I want to talk to you about is what it was like during the launch of your mission. Dick, you've been to space many times before. Jerry, you were a rookie on Friday night when the shuttle lifted off. Tell me, Dick, you start first, just how this liftoff compared to previous ones. And then, Jerry, tell me what it was like for you to do it for the first time. Well, John, uh, for me, uh, I've been real fortunate in the fact that um Three of my previous launches uh, all have gone uh, within about uh, 30 minutes of the planned launch time. So as you know, we had some uh, very uh, iffy weather down there at uh, Kennedy Space Center a couple days ago. And I know most of our attention in the cockpit was uh, looking around outside the windows trying to guess uh, what the weather decision was going to be. For a while it looked uh, pretty bad, but then all of a sudden the blue sky started showing up and uh, all of a sudden optimism within, the, within, the, uh, within Discovery got uh, a lot higher and that was... Uh, seconded by the comments we started receiving from the weather team on the ground. So we went from a little bit of uh, being a little despondent to uh, enthusiastic because we thought we had a chance to go and finally two hours uh, into our launch count we got off the ground. So uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was from a, sort of the uh, agony of defeat to the thrill of victory there for us and I think everybody was excited. Jerry can comment though on his first, uh, first space flight experiences. Uh, extreme excitement. It felt, uh, I kind of thought it was like a herd of buffaloes I was in the middle of, and uh, everything was shaking and rattling, and, and we were really moving, no doubt about it. Uh, and then about two minutes to go uh, before the engine shut off, it felt like about three of those buffaloes sat right on my chest. 
as we uh, had the three G's and sustain them for a while. So, uh, and then when we cut the engines, it was like everything jumped out and we were just floating and uh, just fantastic. Yeah, Dick, did you lose radio communication with the ground at one point during the, the launch sequence? Uh, I, uh, it's right after, uh, right after made engine cutoff, and there was a period of about four minutes uh, where apparently the uh, Houston was unable to talk to us. Uh, however, all of the calls that we were supposed to have received got on board, so it was kind of invisible to us, and uh, we were just marching along through the checklist. Uh, and there weren't any anomalies to be worked, so we didn't have any reason to call Houston. It was only later, which we got when we got some sort of indication that there was an unplanned, unplanned communication drop, but it was basically invisible to us. Yeah. How's the orbiter working right now? All the systems there behind you are in the right positions? All the lights on green instead of red? Uh, they are all on green. Uh, we're in great shape here, and uh, we're uh, marching right along here. And In the background, which you can't see, we've got uh, two crew members, uh, Mark Lee and Susan Helms, uh, uh, activating the SpyFix experiment for the second day of operations there. If occasionally you see the camera wiggle, it's because uh, they're trying to get their job done, so we'll apologize for that. But everything is looking good for uh, the start of day three here. Yeah. Jerry, what's been the most uh, unusual thing, the most unexpected thing to happen to you since you've been in orbit? Again, the launch. I just didn't expect quite the, uh, the thunder and, and lightning and jumping around that we did. Um, and then I guess the stark contrast between that and when the engines cut off, where it's this kind of uh, floating sensation. Then again, looking at the Earth is just an absolutely fantastic uh, experience. But I guess I expected that. Yeah. Can you see anything out the windows right now, or you got to do you have them blocked to keep the the light out of the cockpit? Well, we've got the windows blocked uh, directly behind us, uh, John, just to make the picture look good for you all. But no, I've, I can look off to my left here and uh, got a beautiful view. The other day, Dick, you were talking about the environmental aspects of this mission and why it was so important uh, uh, to, the, to the Earth that you can see out the window there. I'm told, by the way, you're coming up over South America, probably the west coast of South America, so you are in the Pacific moving that way. You'll probably be over South America before we stop talking. But um, tell me about the environment of the planet, both of you, and what you think you might be able to do as astronauts and members of the space program uh, to make the environment down here better, perhaps. You know, we can look uh, exploring both outward and inward and uh, looking out to the stars and our uh, Spartan satellite we're going to launch to look at the sun and uh, learn a little bit more about the medium of space and then looking back toward Earth with all the uh, environmental sorts of things that we can look at with our uh, LIDAR experiment to look at the atmosphere and, and keep tabs of it. So I think there's a uh, great contribution uh, looking both ways and uh, in both cases you'd really advance uh, our understanding of the world and, and of our own planet. Yeah. Dick, what happens if you get a toothache? And <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to comment, John, I have to say something about the primary payload for STS-64, the light experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, uh, it's a po the potential for a real advancement in our, to add to our inventory of uh, spacecraft and low Earth orbit. As, as you know, most of our spacecraft that we have up here are passive in nature. They essentially just take the, the, uh, the light or the electromagnetic radiation radiated by the Earth and try to infer what the atmosphere is doing, particularly in the middle and upper atmosphere. So at, putting an active instrument, one that produces its own source of electromagnetic radiation and penetrating the Earth's atmosphere, Trying to characterize it through that method is, uh, is something different here as far as adding equipment to our mission to plan Earth objectives. So being part of that is pretty exciting for us, and I'm, I'm very hopeful in the news we've gotten so far of the uh, light uh, data takes that we've taken so far indicates that this, is, uh, this has got lots of potential for uh, increasing our understanding of the middle and upper atmosphere. i got to tell both of you, the weather department guys at CNN have been fascinated with the pictures of Tropical Storm Debbie from, uh, from the light experiment. They're things that like nothing you can get from a regular weather satellite photograph. Let me, let me move well, to that's another. That's good to hear, John. No. Go ahead. No, uh, that's good to hear. We just got a little bit of news uh, in the morning mail that was sent up that uh, 
that they had uh, been able to uh, look at Tropical Storm Debbie, and that was very exciting. I wish we could see some of it. Yeah, no kidding. It's too bad that we can see the data on the ground, some of it before you guys get to. The question I was going to ask you a couple minutes ago, what happens if you get a toothache? I came into work yesterday morning with the first toothache I've had in about 20 years, and I'm thinking, well, I can go to the dentist on Monday. What do you do? Well, we've got Jerry on board, so we'll uh, <laughs> let him answer that one. Well, I'm a physician, and I usually don't mess with teeth very much, but Dick, Dick is my backup, and uh, we also had a little dental training there, so uh, we would inject. Uh, we've got a little medical kit down there with all the... Uh, uh, applications that we need. I don't think we'd want to pull a tooth, but we'd uh, be able to temporize until we got back. Um, and along those lines, if, uh, if anyone else gets sick, we all do fine. I'm the one that's afraid of getting sick because Dick becomes my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, you had your 48th birthday uh, a couple weeks ago, and you've been flying in space for, I guess, six years now, maybe from your first mission to this. I may have the, the, the years a little bit off, but uh, is it any different as a 48-year-old guy than it was six years ago? As far as how your body reacts. I sure don't, I sure don't, uh, I sure don't uh, notice any difference. Uh, the only thing I have noticed on my fourth flight is the fact that my body's memory of uh, how it uh, experiences space flight, particularly the first uh, few days, seems to be better as the far as because uh, I'm overcoming the uh, effects of being in a suddenly going from a 1G environment, eight minutes later being in a weightless environment, much faster. And I guess I attribute that, attribute that to the fact that my body just remembers what it's like to be in space. Yeah. So I recommend lots of space flights for everyone. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Jerry, uh, let me ask you this. You know, I'm sure astronauts don't like to exhibit any sign of weakness, physical or any other way, but uh, I talk to astronauts who after their first flight generally have had some space sickness. Uh, Dick says, he was better at it this time. Uh, how about you? Did you get sick? Did anybody get sick? And what did you do for him if they did? Well, actually, uh, we're all doing pretty well. Um, we have some general, you know, anti, it's mainly nausea is what people feel. We have some medications for that. Um, and it usually does the trick. So um, it's just a couple day thing for the most part, if it does at all occur. In my case, I felt great. And um, it, right off the bat, and I was rather surprised to be honest with you. I had all kinds of uh, game plans in mind. And luckily, I didn't have to utilize any of them. Is there a space version of an air sickness bag? There is. It's very similar to any Emesis bag. Uh, it's got a little, uh, little fancier version, I guess, uh, with the little uh, closures on it, so that the, uh, as you can imagine, the Emesis stays where where you want it to stay. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, close one here. Right. And there, you can see it. Fascinating, guys. Thank you for doing this. This is, you know, the viewers who write in to us um, really have questions like that that they want to know about. <laughs> Let's talk more about the thing that seems to be most fascinating to people here on Earth about this mission. It's the, the spacewalk, the untethered uh, spacewalking that uh, Carl and Mark are going to do later. Both of you have critical roles to play in this, as I understand it. Jerry, you're going to be the monitor, and uh, Dick, you're going to be there in case something goes awry. Tell me about uh, what you have trained for, what you've planned for, and, uh, and Jerry in particular, um, you're going to have your nose pressed against the back windows there, I guess, during most of this, aren't you? More or less. I'm uh, more or less choreographing the whole thing. I've been through training with Mark and Carl, and Mark and Carl have done just an outstanding job, and I'm sure this uh, untethered uh, backpack safer EVA is just going to be absolutely uh, fabulous. Um, if I wasn't so busy, I'd be snapping pictures 100 miles an hour, I'm sure, because we're going to get some spectacular shots. But uh, we've got Blaine Hammond that will uh, squeeze out of his duties, and we'll all try to get to the window so that you all can see a little bit of it. I'll record some good pictures down here. I'll send you a tape, okay, because it's uh, something everybody on Earth is really going to be looking forward to, and it's going to happen during daylight hours in the, the United States uh, next Friday. So we're all looking very forward to this. I, I think I need to ask the worst that can happen question, though, to both of you. Dick, um, let's, let's say something goes wrong with these uh, jetpacks and Carl Mead um, or, uh, or, or Mark gets to a point where he can't get back uh, unless you move the shuttle. Uh, how much have you prepared for that and, uh, and how would it work? Uh, well, we've prepared extensively for that. Uh, we've got some very good simulators in Houston, uh, which I think we've, uh, we've 
to about step through every possible scenario here for these failure modes that you referred to. Uh, essentially, uh, what would happen is, first, the, the, the most important feature of it is just to recognize that a failure has occurred. A lot of times, uh, Carl and Mark, when they get out there, they get oriented into a position where they may or may not be able to see orbiter structure, so it's hard to tell then. They don't have anything to, to determine their rates from, and sometimes we can see it in, inside the vehicle more quickly than maybe what they can. Other times, they, uh, if they do have orbiter structure, they see it much quicker than we do. It's just a question of recognition, and then there's just a few simple steps that we go through to save the safer system, and then it's a question of flying the orbiter over to them. I don't consider it very much different than uh, what we would do, uh, what we were going to do the day before, which is uh, re-rendezvous with the Spartan satellite, grapple it, and put it back in the payload bay. It just, uh, whether it's a human being or uh, a spacecraft, uh, once it's non-maneuvering, uh, it's a question of just flying the orbiter up, getting it in a close proximity so they can reach out and grab a uh, grab the arm. It's much easier, of course, with a human because they've got they've got eyes and hands to deal with, and so we just have to get them relatively close. Yeah. Okay, Jerry. Uh, one of your primary responsibilities on this mission is to look after these getaway special canisters. Look like garbage cans to me out in the cargo bay. What are some of the more interesting things going on in those? Okay, I think the best way to describe it is this variety. They've got everything going on back there, distillation experiments, some microgravity experiments. Uh, we just looked this morning, and, and uh, last night we opened up a door, exposed some uh, ESA experiments, European Space Agency experiments, the atmosphere. Uh, I think one of the fun ones is the uh, Utah State had an elementary school uh, close by, and they had the students uh, put some popcorn seeds in there, and then they have some back on Earth, and uh, when we return, they'll be popping both kernels and see which type they like the best. Yeah, you got a shot at any of that popcorn? Are they going to share with you at all, do you think? Well, uh, we've got a couple crewmen on board that have a reputation for eating everything, so when they get close <laughs> enough to that gas can on that deep, safer EVA, we're going to be watching them real close. Tell me something. This is a personal question, a human being question for both of you. It looks like you guys are having a heck of a good time up there. How, how much time do you get to have fun versus uh, to do the, the hard work that you're assigned to do on these things? Well, I'm hesitant to tell you the truth there, John, because Mission Control would hear it and then put more work in there for us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, we, uh, we've got a great work environment to here, and uh, just doing work is fun, in my opinion. Uh, being able to get the experiments uh, operating, the only time that we don't have fun is when the uh, experiments uh, here don't necessarily go the way that they should. And, uh, of course, we've worked with these people on the ground, and, uh, and we know that they've got put many years of work on, on, on almost all of these things on board, so we really feel for them when things uh, don't work, but we're exhilarated when things do work properly. Uh, so just working and, making, and seeing these experiments that have, we've worked on for years come to fruition is, is one of the more exciting elements of spaceflight. And then uh, other, there, we have other times when uh, we're waiting in between events to just be able to take in the view that we've got outside the window and float around and have fun. So it's a, it's a totally 100% uh, fun environment as far as I'm concerned. John, I have to tell you, I'm a big Michigan fan. I was excited to hear Michigan beating Notre Dame yesterday. But the biggest cheer here was when uh, we got the Spyfex picture uh, looking back at the shuttle. And I don't know if you saw that, but uh, we let out a yell that uh, the people at and uh, that Michigan game couldn't have yelled any louder than the six of us. So I agree with Dick. There's a great sense of accomplishment, and, and that's fun. Jerry and Dick, thank you both. We're out of time. I have seen the SpyFX picture. We're going to share it with our viewers a little bit later. Thank you for joining us as well. It's John Holloman, CNN reporting. Fascinating stuff. That is World News for now. I'm Simeon Smith. Travel Guide is next on CNN International after a quick look at the hour's headlines. Above the Atlantic coast of Brazil. Discovery continues to silently orbit the Earth, but inside the spacecraft, the astronauts are busy conducting experiments. 
One of the primary goals of the mission is to test out a $25 million laser machine designed to explore the Earth's atmosphere. Discovery Commander Dick Richards explains. I have to say something about the primary payload for STS-64, the light experiment. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, a potential for a real advancement in our, to add to our inventory of uh, spacecraft in low Earth orbit. As, as you know, most of our spacecraft that we have up here are passive in nature. They essentially just take the, the, uh, the light or the electromagnetic radiation radiated by the Earth and try to infer what the atmosphere is doing, particularly in the middle and upper atmosphere. So at, putting an active instrument, one that produces its own sorts of electromagnetic radiation and penetrating the Earth's atmosphere, trying to characterize it through that method is, uh, is something different here as far as adding the equipment to our mission to plan Earth objectives. So being part of that is pretty exciting for us, and I'm, I'm very hopeful in the news we've gotten so far of the uh, light uh, data takes that we've taken so far indicates that this is uh, this has got lots of potential for uh, increasing our understanding of the middle and upper atmosphere. Dort ist am Samstag bei den Antillen ein Hurricane aufgetaucht, Debbie genannt, und der zog am Wochenende westwärts. Am Sonntag lag er hier südlich von Haiti, jetzt genau heute südlich von Haiti und zieht nun auf Jamaika zu, was Sie hier erkennen können. Allerdings wird er dabei schwächer. Es ist also nicht damit zu rechnen, dass noch große Zerstörungen eintreten werden. Warten wir mal ab, bis der nächste kommt. Der fängt ja dann mit E an. Bis dahin, einen schönen Abend und tschüss. Using thrusters the size of a thumb to slowly travel back to safety, all the astronaut has to do to rescue himself is press the button on the pack. And then automatically it stabilizes you. And then it's a very easy problem from then on because all your rotational movements are being controlled by the system. All you have to worry about is, is straight line motion. But powering this latest high-tech invention is a little more down to earth. In fact, 24 nine volt batteries will help protect those astronauts high above in space. Mark Lyons, ITN, Washington. The government agency responsible for protecting the U.S. president is reviewing its security procedures. One slammed into the White House lawn. The pilot, a 38-year-old truck driver named Frank Corda, died in the crash. Some relatives believed Corda was trying to kill himself. Others say he may have been trying to land the plane for notoriety, not to crash it. But at this point, investigators do not believe he was out to harm the president. Der Name des griechischen Sagenhelden wurde nicht umsonst gewählt. Odysseus, so sagen wir, startete als erster, so die Sage, eine Reise ins Nichts, weit über die Säulen des Herkules, die Meerenge von Gibraltar hinaus, buchstäblich ins damals unbekannte Nichts des Atlantiks. Ähnlich abenteuerlich ist das Unternehmen Ulysses der Neuzeit. Die Planeten Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus und Neptun erhielten alle schon Besuch von technischen Botschaftern des Planeten Erde. Die Pole der Sonne werden nun erstmals von der Sonde Ulysses angeflogen. Spektakuläre Bilder wird es keine geben. Ulysses ist eher eine stille Sonde ganz im Sinne der Wissenschaft. Hildegard Wert. Wenn von der Raumsonde Ulysses die Rede ist, geraten Astronomen ins Schwärmen. Ulysses ist das schnellste Raumfahrzeug, das je von Menschenhand gebaut wurde. Und es ist das erste, das die vertrauten Routen der Planetenebene verlassen hat, um Neuland zu erkunden. Der Flug über die Pole der Sonne ist eine der letzten Pioniertaten, die noch zu tun übrig geblieben ist. Der Anblick ist uns mittlerweile vertraut. Die Sonne als riesiger Fusionsreaktor. Ein blubberndes Energiemonster. Mit ihrem Magnetfeld schützt die Sonne ihre Planeten vor dem ständigen Bombardement aus den Weiten des Alls. Wenn es schwächer wird, dringt kosmische Strahlung und interstellare Materie tief in den Bereich der Planeten ein. Spuren davon fanden Klimaforscher in den Jahresringen uralter Bäume. Während der letzten 7000 Jahre, so die Botschaft der Bäume, schien die Sonne nicht gleichmäßig. Die Folge, ein Auf und Ab der Temperaturen, im Rhythmus von Jahrhunderten. Die Klimageschichte der Erde ist eine Geschichte des ständigen Wandels, in dem die Sonne die Hauptrolle spielt. Auf seinem Weg zum Rand der Heliosphäre konnte Ulysses die Botschaften des Sonnenwindes lesen. Er fand seltsame Löcher im Magnetfeld. Die Folge dichter heißer Gasnebel, meinen die Astronomen, 
die den Magnetismus stellenweise auslöschen. Das Magnetfeld der Sonne ist überhaupt eines der bizarrsten Kapitel der Astronomie. Es schwingt und wippt und manchmal kippt es gar um. Ballerinaröckchen nennen die Wissenschaftler dieses Phänomen. Eines der vielen Rätsel der Sonne, die noch auf eine Lösung warten. Ulysses fliegt nun in einem Sicherheitsabstand von 350 Millionen Kilometern über den Südpol der Sonne. Dort liest er Teilchen auf, die von noch viel weiter draußen stammen. Material, aus dem sich einst Sterne und Planeten formten. Wer nun spektakuläre Bilder erwartet, wird enttäuscht werden. Ein endloser Strom von Messdaten ist der einzige Lohn für die Mühe von 100 Wissenschaftlern, die nun jahrelang damit beschäftigt sein werden, all dies in ein neues Konzept der Sonne einzubauen. Die Abenteuer der Sonde Ulysses sind damit noch nicht zu Ende. Nächstes Jahr wird sie den Nordpol der Sonne überfliegen, stürmischen Zeiten entgegen. Denn bis zum Jahr 2000 erwacht die Sonne wieder zu neuer Aktivität. Wenn er technisch durchhält, könnte Ulysses dann wieder als himmlischer Horchposten aktiv werden. Discovery. Astronauts used a robotic arm to deploy the Spartan satellite. It is studying solar winds, charged particles blown from the sun, which can cause power outages and communications problems on Earth. Wednesday they will test jetpacks on spacesuits for future space walks. The Mir space station, Russian cosmonauts took a walk in space Tuesday. The captain and engineer were arranging the exterior of the station to prepare for some extraterrestrial visitors. Next May, the US space shuttle Atlantis is due to rendezvous with the Russian station. Mit der Raumsonde Ulysses allerdings ist die Erde den Geheimnissen der Sonne jetzt eine Spur näher gekommen. Von der Discovery schon 1990 ins All katapultiert, erreichte die Ulysses über Irrwege jetzt den Südpol der Sonne und kam ihr damit so nah wie niemals ein Satellit zuvor. Der Grund, an den Polen beträgt die Temperatur nur etwa 2 Millionen Grad, 6 Millionen weniger als am Sonnenäquator. Schon nach den ersten Daten ist klar, die Sonne ist viel unberechenbarer als angenommen und ihre Magnetfelder beeinflussen auch die Vorgänge auf der Erde. So wollen Wissenschaftler mit den Daten der Ulysses beweisen, dass hiesige Klimaveränderungen auch durch die Sonne hervorgerufen werden. Noch bis zum Jahr 2000 soll die Raumsonde aufschlussreiche Informationen über den mächtigen Himmelskörper zur Erde schicken. Weltraumstation Mir sind erneut ins All ausgestiegen. Sie bereiteten die Station gestern auf das Andocken zweier wissenschaftlicher Bauelemente im nächsten Jahr vor. Bereits am 3. Oktober soll der deutsche Astronaut Meerbold zusammen mit zwei Russen vom Weltraumbahnhof Baikonur aus zur Raumstation fliegen. Dort soll Meerbold bis Anfang November 30 meist medizinische Experimente leiten. Welcome back to World News Time now to bring you up to date on the hour's top story. We have taken their first steps on an untethered walk in space. The main mission is, mission is to test their jet backpacks for maneuverability. It's been 10 years since the last untethered spacewalk, and this walk should last for approximately four more hours. NASA says if this is successful, it will demonstrate that astronauts accidentally disconnected from a space station can use the power pack to get back to safety. Wenige Stunden zuvor hatten die Männer eine andere Aufgabe erfolgreich gelöst. Mit einem 15 Meter langen Roboterarm fingen sie den 14 Millionen Dollar teuren Satelliten Spartan wieder ein und buxierten ihn zurück in die Ladebucht der Raumfähre. Spartan hatte zwei Tage lang Daten über den sogenannten Sonnenwind gesammelt. Am Montag soll die Discovery mit ihren sechs Besatzungsmitgliedern zur Erde zurückkehren. Nur wenige Wochen nach dem Kometeneinschlag auf dem Jupiter erwarten Sternenforscher schon wieder bahnbrechende Erkenntnisse. Diesmal direkt aus der Mitte unseres Sonnensystems. Ulysses, eine Raumsonde, überquerte heute als erster künstlicher Himmelskörper den Südpol der Sonne. Am 6. Oktober 1990 war Ulysses von einem Space Shuttle der NASA ausgesetzt worden. Jetzt, nach vier Jahren und eineinhalb Milliarden Kilometern, hat sie ihr erstes Ziel erreicht, den Südpol der Sonne. Auf dem Weg dorthin musste sich die 370 Kilogramm schwere europäische Sonde jedoch erst einmal von der Sonne wegbewegen, hin zum Planeten Jupiter. Im Schwerefeld dieses Riesen holte Ulysses Schwung, um die Ebene der Erdbahn zu verlassen und zum Südpol der Sonne zu fliegen. Die ersten Erkenntnisse der Astronomen sind so erstaunlich, dass die Experten ihre bisherigen Theorien beispielsweise über den Magnetismus der Sonne und den Sonnenwind über Bord werfen müssen. Noch schlauer werden sie im Juli nächsten Jahres sein. Dann überfliegt Ulysses auch den Nordpol der Sonne. 
Etwas näher an der Erde vollzieht sich derzeit eine weitere Premiere. Zwei Astronauten der NASA bewegen sich sechs Stunden lang außerhalb der Raumfähre Discovery, erstmals seit zehn Jahren ohne Rettungsleine. Die beiden testen ein neues Rettungssystem für Astronauten mit dem Namen SAFER. Dieser Rucksackraketenantrieb soll abdriftende Astronauten zurück zu ihrem Raumschiff oder ihrer Raumstation bringen können. Und nicht nur im Raketenkontrollzentrum in Cape Canaveral hofft man, dass dieser Versuch nicht misslingt. Zwei Astronauten der US-Raumfähre Discovery schweben zur Stunde ohne die üblichen Sicherungsleinen im All. Sie erproben neu entwickelte Antriebsrucksäcke mit jeweils 24 Düsen. Mission Specialist Mark Lee hier. Künftig sollen Astronauten mit den 40 Kilogramm schweren Rettungsgeräten selbstständig manövrieren können, falls sie bei Montagearbeiten von einer Raumstation abdriften. Astronaut Lee erreichte heute eine Geschwindigkeit von 15 cm pro Sekunde. Er funkte zur Erde, sein Rucksack funktioniere erstklassig. Zum Abschluss des sechsstündigen Tests soll einer der Astronauten seinen Kameraden kräftig herumwirbeln, um zu sehen, ob er sich selbst wieder fangen kann. In der vergangenen Nacht war es der Astronautin Helms trotz einer Radarstörung gelungen, mit einem 15 Meter langen Greifarm den Satelliten Spartan wieder in die Ladebucht der Fähre zu holen. Er hatte die Sonnenwinde erforscht und sich bei seinem Flug etwa 80 Kilometer von der Fähre entfernt. Sie soll am Montag zur Erde zurückkehren. Ganz ohne Verbindung zum Raumschiff schweben Miet und Lee. Sie sollen in einer sechsstündigen Aktion das neue Rettungssystem SAFER testen. SAFER ist eine Art Mini-Antrieb, mit dem sich die Astronauten wieder zu ihrem Raumschiff Discovery zurückmanövrieren können. Three fire engines here. A fourth is now entering the northwest gate at the White House. And uh, there are at least two dozen or so fire, firemen uh, all over the place with uh, hoses and ladders getting ready for something. But we, again, we do not know much more than that. Uh, here comes uh, a fourth fire engine right now. Uh, and we see that the hook and ladder, uh, if you want to pan over there, we see a, a hook and ladder now beginning to go up in front of the west wing. Uh, this is a diplomatic entrance uh, where uh, only moments ago we just saw by chance the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who just emerged and went into the west wing. He has a meeting here, we're told, on the situation in Haiti as well. But uh, these firemen are definitely getting uh, involved in something going on here at the White House. And uh, you can now see this hook and ladder going up to the second uh, floor here at the residence at the White House. We do know that uh, this has been an extraordinary week. It started off here at the White House when a small Cessna landed on the south lawn and there were fire engines and bomb squads that arrived. And now this week seems to be ending with uh, a bit of a fire and some smoke. But once again, we have no word on how serious, if serious at all. But we do see a lot of fire, uh, firemen and equipment all over the place here gearing up. We don't have anyone who has yet climbed up on that ladder to go up on the roof of the uh, west wing. Let me just set the, set the scene over here. The uh, fire was reported in the west wing, which is not the, in the residence where the president was having his meeting in the dining room, in the east room, excuse me, with the uh, international coalition, including the exiled president, Aristide. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the activity here is a good 200 feet or so from the residence. It's mostly centered here in the uh, west wing. So the president is far away. The vice president is in the east room. All of the officials are over there. Uh, we have not seen any evacuation, though, of the West Wing. Uh, we haven't seen any uh, people scrambling out, but we see a lot of reporters, camera crews, and other personnel trying to find out exactly what is going on. But once again, these uh, fire engines, four of them, are now here, three outside the West Wing, one protectively, we can now see outside the main residence of the White House. Agreed? Right, Wolf, is there any indication a lot of uh, refurbishment was going on at the White House that caused the Clintons to have to move over to Blair House for a couple of days? Has it anything to do, do you suppose, with that? No, uh, the, the, all the uh, refurbishment was going on in the residence, and the smoke was detected on the second floor, we're told, uh, of the West Wing, where all the offices are, the Oval Office, of course, 
the president's office, all of the senior officials, they have their offices here in the West Wing. That's where the activity is, and none of the remodeling, the uh, air conditioning renovation, none of that was going on in the West Wing. All of that was going on in the residence, and I don't see how that could have been related to the activity that's now underway here. And as you pointed out, well, for all of the, uh, the activity that we just saw diplomatically took place far away over on the other East Wing side. That's correct. In the main, in the main uh, residence of the White House, in the east room, so it's pretty far away. So once again, we have no indication that there is any uh, any trouble, any serious trouble. I did smell smoke, as I as I, uh, I mentioned earlier, and I did uh, begin to see a little bit of smoke. But other than that, I have not seen any major activity, except a lot of firemen are here with a lot of equipment. I'm now right. getting some more information from our uh, White House producer, Carol Craddy. Carol? Oh, and we now have been told by the White House Deputy Press Secretary, Jenny Terrazano, that there is no fire, but uh, w was there some smoke? There, there was some smoke, yes. Smelled smoke. Yeah. Uh, uh, wait a second, Jill Doherty is, is our other White House correspondent. Come on over here, Jill. Uh, could you report to us what exactly you've been told by the White House uh, staff? The White House spokesperson, Ginny Trezano, says that there is no fire at the White House. Apparently, a member of the White House staff smelled some smoke. It's not clear that there actually was any smoke, but smelled smoke, turned in the alarm. Uh, they thought it was on the second floor of the West Wing, but that is about what we know. They're gathering the facts, and we'll have more from Didi Myers later. Okay, that was Jill Doherty, our other White House correspondent, reporting on what the White House press uh, office is now telling us, that staff smells some smoke on the second floor of the west wing far away from where the president is the president is still in the residence in the east room where he's meeting with the uh, representatives of the 24 nations that have joined this coalition to uh, get ready for an invasion of haiti but once again uh, there is no fire we're told by the deputy press secretary jenny terrazano but there was some smoke and that's why protectively the fire department the washington dc fire department was alerted was brought over here and uh, firemen are now running inside uh, the west wing to make sure that there is nothing serious going on reed right, well thank you uh, we have then denied another old adage that where there is smoke there is not necessarily fire but there is the subject at hand which was haiti we're going to get back to that and further discussion of it in just a few minutes CNN breaking news. We're going back to the White House and uh, with Dee Dee Myers, the White House press secretary, and, uh, will have something some to say, we believe now, odor. about a and recent so fire incident uh, that has brought the they fire engines. Look at it. There's absolutely no threat, no danger of fire. There's been no, nothing is burned at all. Uh, they're up there now replacing the ballast of this light fixture, and uh, I think that's all there is to it. So it's really, uh, we're very grateful that the, the department turned out so quickly. Yet? No, the president was, is still in the, uh, in the residence. Like, was the uh, wing evacuated? No. No one was Everything. No one was evacuated. Body. Nothing burned. It was just again. It was a uh, light picture shorted out, and, they, and there was a strong odor. Uh, so they took a precaution and called the fire department. And I think glad to know we get a very solid response. <laughs> Everything by Charles. Going to say. <laughs> I know. Was it a staff member who noticed it? Yeah, it was. Hey, what else so, happened the floor Second floor of the West Wing. What office exactly was that, Didi? It's the uh, Carol Rouse. There's a small outer office outside Carol Rasco's office okay. on the uh, upstairs. So, I where is Shelley meeting with the uh, leader? In, in the same room. They're, they're, he's briefing them now uh, at the same table that they were at. And then Gray is coming out here. At Gray and Sandy will be here at three. Did the president know about this? I don't think he's been briefed yet. No, he's still meeting with the. There was a light fixture that shorted out, and uh, there was a very strong odor. And so the um, staff members up there contacted the fire department as a precaution. They came, determined that it was simply this light fixture, and they're replacing the ballast of the fixture. Um, and there's absolutely no threat. No one's been evacuated. In fact, most of the members of the fire department are already back outside, and I'm sure they'll be leaving any minute. Everything under control? Everything's under control. Where was the smoke coming from? It, it was a light fixture in, a, in the office outside Carol Rasco's office, up on the second floor of the West Wing. Second floor legislative office? Uh, no, 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 domestic policy. So closer to where Hillary's office is? Yeah. Same row, I mean, same, same side row, of the building. Same side of the, same building. Side of the wing. This didn't have anything to do with the, the renovations? Uh, no, uh-uh. Right, and, and that's all has to do with... Coming the, from, so there was an electrical... No, no, it, 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 a light fixture shorted out. 
and um, so there wasn't an odor. No, it's on the ceiling. And so they're replacing, they just went in and they're now replacing the ballast, what they call the ballast of this fixture. And uh, everything is completely under control. <laughs> was this in her she, she's in the building, yeah. Was she in her office? In the I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I believe she was, yeah. She was? And do you know who called? Uh, Carol Roscoe's assistant. I heard it was a worst <laughs> movie trap. Yeah. Pardon me? Right down the hall? Yes, yeah, down the hall. From what? The fire department. This is the easy stuff. We're just glad everything's fine, everything's under control, no one was evacuated, everything's in good shape. DD, who called the fire department? Uh, the one of the staff the members upstairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could the participants yeah. in the meeting hear the uh, commotion? No, no, they're way over in the residence, and this happened on you... oh, the other side of the west wing. I that was in your office. I'll have to check. I, didn't, I, I think she was, because there were agents up there, but... Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, DD. Wolf, Wolf Blitzer, can, can you rejoin us and perhaps put an end to this fire once and for all? Our White House capacity for distraction is unlimited, isn't it? That's right, Reed. Uh, there is, according to White House Press Secretary D.D. Myers, good news, a light fixture on the second floor of the West Wing right behind me, the main office complex of the White House, started to smoke. As a precaution, White House staff called up the local D.C. Fire Department Four engines arrived here within minutes. They are now making sure that there's nothing else. Uh, D.D. Meyer says there was no evacuation, uh, no major fire, no fire at all, just smoke, and that there is nothing to be concerned about. The president, the vice president, all of the senior staff, for the most part, were way over in the residence of the White House, in the main White House building, hosting this uh, international delegation of coalition partners involved in the Haiti operation. They probably may know about it by, by now, but they had no knowledge of what was going on as these fire engines roared here into the uh, driveway uh, outside uh, the west wing of the White House. So once again, looks like the situation has been resolved protectively. The fire department is just going through the motions to make sure there is nothing else. But D.D. Myers assures all of us that it was just smoke, no fire, and that uh, business will now go back to usual, if we can say that after a little bit of a disruption here at the White House. Reed? Well, thank you. We're going to get back to the business at hand, that is, this big strategy session on Haiti and what we can glean from it right after this. These are pictures of crew members Mark Lee and Carl Mead taking the first untethered spacewalk by a U.S. astronaut in more than a decade. The images you're seeing now have been speeded up to three times normal. The astronauts propel themselves using new $7 million jetpacks. NASA hopes they can be used as a rescue device for future astronauts who become disconnected while constructing a space station. We'll have more on the spacewalk and Discovery's mission later in our focus segment. Scientists are celebrating the success of the space probe Ulysses, the first spacecraft to fly over the sun's south pole. They say it's gathered valuable new information about solar winds and the sun's magnetic field. The data may help in understanding the cycles of solar activity that affect the Earth's climate. Our science correspondent Eric McInnes reports. The sun, the centre of our solar system, without which life could not exist. But while this enormous, burning, gaseous sphere dominates our existence, we have only ever had a narrow view of it, looking at it from Earth or Earth's orbit. Now, the space probe Ulysses has gone where no man-made object has gone before. Out of our orbiting plane into uncharted space in order to observe the sun from a very unique perspective. The probe was launched by Shuttle Discovery four years ago, traveling faster than any object ever propelled into space. But rather than head straight for the sun, it went in the opposite direction, to Jupiter. Then using Jupiter's gravity, rather like a slingshot, it accelerated downward. Ulysses is now over one billion miles into its journey, sending back data on the sun's magnetic field and the solar storms which affect Earth's technology. If we knew more about that sort of propagation, uh from the sun we could prepare for storms electromagnetic storms much more effectively of course if you're in space and in orbit and you're an astronaut you don't want to be out in a storm the european space agency said they'd been surprised by the data at the moment we're puzzled we're still trying to digest those data 
and really form a picture of what this is telling us. But it certainly ne means one thing. We're going to have to rethink our ideas about how the sun's magnetism is carried into the solar wind. Scientists hope to have digested the information about magnetic fields in time for Ulysses' pass over the North Pole next year. They hope then to have a better understanding of the data being sent back now. Ulysses levert the onderzoekers een schat aan informatie, die soms meer vragen oproept dan antwoorden levert. Do you understand all the data you have at the moment? Oh goodness, no. No. Not no. by far. Yeah, not by far. Right. Komend jaar vliegt Ulysses over de Noordpool van de zon en daarna terug naar Jupiter. Ulysses heeft een uh, elektriciteitsbron aan boord die wel na verloop van tijd opraakt. Dus in december 2001 is het echt definitief voorbij. Ulysses is eigenlijk een komeet geworden. Hij blijft uh, helemaal uh, tot het einde van dagen om de zon heen draaien. Maar we kunnen hem niet meer beluisteren. Friday, two US astronauts on board the space shuttle Discovery ventured outside the spacecraft without a safety line. The untethered walk was made possible by a jet-powered backpack. Discovery's free-floating astronauts and their mission in space is the subject of our focus segment at this hour. And we're joined by CNN's John Holman. John, it's nearly over. How's it gone so far? Well, the astronauts say they are having a terrific time out in space. They are supposed to come back indoors in about uh, 12 or 13 minutes from now. I don't know if we have live picture we can show you right now, but I'll tell you that the astronauts have uh, must be feeling pretty sad right now. Here is live picture from space. You can see. Uh, Carl Mead and uh, Mark Lee there near the uh, the back of the space shuttle Discovery. They're probably going to have to go through the airlock door any minute now to go back inside. Their six-hour spacewalk just about completed. They have certainly completed their test of the new jet backpack, which could be used to rescue an astronaut in a future accident. And their ground-based managers are about to tell them it's time to come back in. How do they communicate with each other in and outside the space shuttle? Uh, they have two-way radios that are in their uh, in their helmets, and they can use those to talk just as they do uh, when they're inside the shuttle. Although the quality of the two-way radios that they use outside is certainly not as clear as it is on the inside ones. We had some pictures about 15 minutes ago that I'd like to show you now. It was the the final phase of Carl Mead's spacewalk. You see him there out near the top of the robot arm, and in just a second you're going to see another uh, another view of this same thing with the earth in the background. It sort of looks like somebody walking in the middle of the of the sky and what you see there is the uh, that's actually the Pacific Ocean as it looked about 15 minutes ago and uh, what Mead was doing was trying to remain stable with his jet backpack in this How position. would he do that? How would he remain stable? Uh, not wiggle is the short answer. Um, part of this exercise is for Mead to fly the jet backpack. Hit a, it has a controller which is on the front in his right hand. He uses his left hand to operate it, which would make him move down the robot arm and back into the cargo bay. And I don't know if you can tell it from this picture, but he is actually beginning to do that while we watch. While the jet backpack test was going on um, with uh, Carl Mead, Mark Lee, his spacewalking partner, was um, uh, was also down at, in the cargo bay of the shuttle. These two fellows have an opportunity that is unique to uh, astronauts or Soviet cosmonauts, Russian cosmonauts now. They can go outside and see without thick safety glass, which is included on the shuttle. Explain to me, if you could, John, what is this turning around movement? How do they do that? Well, in this experiment, the astronaut connected to the robot arm, the one on the right, takes his partner in his arms and spins him. The reason for doing the spinning is that in, uh, in an accident, if an astronaut were working hooked up by a tether line to the shuttle and he broke free for some reason, his body would almost certainly go into a spin, either a head over heel spin or a side to side spin. Here you can see a head over heel spin. And uh, the jet backpack has a button that you push called stabilize and you push that button and all of a sudden the spinning is stopped automatically by the jets. It recognizes a spin and can tell you uh, how and can stop it and turn you around so that you can get back to safety.
But what would have happened right now, say the jetpack hadn't worked, what would have happened? That astronaut would have continued spinning, uh, and he would have continued, I'm sure, moving away from the shuttle. You can see he's using it to propel himself now toward his partner, and you can see the partner waving him in with hand motions there. These pictures, by the way, we've increased the speed to about three times normal to let this, uh, this event happen a little bit more quickly. But um, he would have just tumbled end over end over end. You remember the movie 2001, Lost in space? A, a Space Odyssey or Lost in Space? Sure, the, um, the people, I mean, those movies, that's the horrible part of those movies, but that's what would happen. There would be nothing to stop you unless you had some sort of, uh, of rocket or jet force to, to slow the motion. So, you know, How fast are they actually going? 17,500 miles an hour, give or take two or three miles an hour, is, uh, is how far. We're back to live picture now. And uh, from, from where we sit, you can see the astronauts continue to work around in the cargo bay. This is a very close-up shot of, um, of Meade and Lee. They're working with some tools. At the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you can see one of the tools looks similar to a wrench that was used uh, in the Hubble Space Telescope repair mission, which you and I covered back uh, last year or earlier this year. And um, the astronauts are, one of the things that they have to do when they're out in the cargo bay is make sure that there's nothing loose out there while they're, uh, while they're walking around because they don't want anything, once they go back inside, no human beings will be in the cargo bay until after the shuttle lands. So they want to make sure that they've cleaned up their garbage and that there's nothing in there that could cause damage on the, the re-entry of the shuttle. I have a feeling after they get back inside, it's going to be sort of a boring weekend for them because uh, um, the, the best is over. They have uh, some more experiments to do. They have um, some ham radio communication to do with ham radio operators around the world. They've made hundreds of contacts so far on this mission. But um, on Sunday, they'll begin packing up all their equipment and supplies. And the plan is for them to try to land in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center from whence they left on, uh, on Monday. In terms of what have we actually learned throughout this particular shuttle mission? There are a lot of things. We've learned that it is possible to use a laser gun to uh, fire laser beams down at clouds above the Earth and not only tell how thick the clouds are and how fast the clouds are moving, but to actually see through the clouds. It was something that uh, they had no idea they were going to be able to do. This, this will help environmentalists in, in watching uh, uh, volcanoes without uh, having to worry about the cloud of smoke coming out of the volcano. It, um, it's going to be probably, that particular instrument is going to be managed or uh, eventually mounted on a satellite permanently orbiting the Earth. Environmentalists say it will be one of the most wonderful tools they have to see who is polluting, how much they are polluting, and perhaps to figure out a way to get them to stop polluting by saying, you know, it's kind of a cop in the sky to point down and, um, and say you're doing bad things. Before we end, John, on these two men who are out mm -hmm. in space now, it's their first time in space. Yes. What have you been hearing from the conversations? What are they saying about it? They started it? out this morning very sort of calm sounding, and then they had a little problem. There was a mechanical problem with uh, one of the, the rechargers that they use for the spacesuit, and there was a little nervousness there. And um, then as the afternoon or the day has progressed, the six hours has progressed, uh, they got more and more excited. I mean, this is, uh, when they come back inside and start talking to their partners, I doubt NASA will let us listen in, but I bet what they talk about is going to be uh, how, how wonderful it was and, uh, and uh, how happy they are. They are the ones who got to do the spacewalk. CNN's John Holloman, thank you so much for filling us in on everything that's going on up there in space. Thank you so much, It's John. always fun to be with you. And that concludes this hour's Focus segment. And that is World News for Now. I'm Sonia Rusler. World Sport is coming up right after a look at the world's weather. From all of us at CNN International, thanks for joining us.
Zum ersten Mal seit zehn Jahren wieder einen Weltraumspaziergang ohne Rettungsleine. Die zwei Besatzungsmitglieder der Raumfähre Discovery testeten ein neues Rettungssystem. Mit der Rucksackrakete, genannt Safer, können sie sich frei im All bewegen. Am Montag soll die Discovery zur Erde zurückkehren. Mark Lee und Carl Mead took turns using the pack to fly free of the shuttle. It was the first untethered spacewalk in 10 years. The jetpack is designed to serve as a life preserver if an astronaut were in an emergency. The US Space Agency says it passed the test with flying colors. Most of the wet weather into the southeastern U.S. associated with an old tropical low which has drifted on shore. High pressure will keep things dry for much of the rest of the U.S. and much of uh, western Canada will see fair weather. Although a new front is uh, approaching the Pacific Northwest coast and there will be a few clouds, scattered showers associated with it. That is an updated look at your world weather forecast. Mead und Mark Lee haben ihren Weltraumspaziergang nach sechs Stunden erfolgreich beendet. Der Ausflug in die Schwerelosigkeit wurde im US-Fernsehen live übertragen. Völlig losgelöst schwebten die Männer im All. Erfolgreich testeten sie die neu entwickelten Rucksackraketen. Der Rückstoß der Düsen treibt die Astronauten in die gewünschte Richtung. Dieses System macht es möglich, sich ohne Verbindung zum Mutterschiff frei zu bewegen. Ein Abdriften, der Albtraum jedes Astronauten, wird so verhindert. Die Männer waren begeistert. Selbst diese Rotationsbewegung um die eigene Achse wurde mit Hilfe des Mini-Antriebs schnell gestoppt. Bei künftigen Missionen soll das Aggregat vor allem in Notsituationen eingesetzt werden, zum Beispiel, wenn eine Sicherheitsleine reißt. Spaziergang von Mark Lee und Carl Mead. Die beiden Astronauten der Raumfähre Discovery erprobten einen neuen Antriebsrucksack vom Typ Safer und das mit Erfolg. Völlig frei ohne Verbindung mit dem Raumschiff schwebten sie im All. Der Safer-Test war der Höhepunkt des zehntägigen Weltraumfluges der Discovery. Übermorgen soll die Fähre zur Erde zurückkehren. Experiments come at the end of a successful 10-day mission for the shuttle and as Mark Orchard reports, they mark NASA's return to spacewalking. Orbiting the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour, astronaut Mark Lee boldly does what no one has done for over a decade and drifts untethered in space. The purpose of this exercise was to test NASA's new jet-propelled backpack, which is both lighter and easier to use than the old model. With fellow astronaut Carl Mead standing on the end of Discovery's robot arm, Lee practices the emergency rescue procedure. 42-30, At the push of a button, the battery-powered pack automatically stabilizes the spinning astronaut, allowing him to regain control. NASA say the tests on the new pack were successful, which means future shuttle crews will be able to spend more time outside the orbiter. Mead und Lee haben ihren Weltraumspaziergang nach sechseinhalb Stunden erfolgreich beendet. Sie hatten das neuartige Rettungssystem Safer, eine Art Mini-Antriebsaggregat mit Steuerdüsen, getestet. Damit soll ein versehentliches Abdriften in den Weltraum verhindert werden. Der Spaziergang, Höhepunkt des zehntägigen Raumflugs, war der erste Ausflug von US-Astronauten ohne Sicherungsleinen seit zehn Jahren. New tropical wave will be moving towards uh, sections of the Leeward and Windward Islands. Could be more rain into the area over the next several days. It's a quick look at your weather. A complete forecast is coming up within the hour. Friday, two of the crew took turns using a jetpack for the first untethered spacewalks in a decade. The shuttle mission was supposed to end Sunday after nine days, but astronauts have conserved enough electricity for an extra day. Lots of rain in the south and eastern United States, through the Great Lakes region, both the Canadian and U.S. side, and uh, farther northward across James Bay. In the west, there will be rain also, and in the higher elevations, it'll be a cool rain across the mountains of the western U.S. Thank projects. You so Using an instrument-equipped boom, they conducted another round of jet plume research to analyze exhaust from the shuttle's jets. Discovery also showered Earth with more than a million pulses of green laser light to study the atmosphere. The mission, which has been extended to a tenth day, is scheduled to return to Earth on Monday.
Some of these producing some strong gusty winds and even some hail possible with a few of these storms as they continue to circulate around an upper uh, level area of low pressure. Strongest thunderstorms now are through the windward passage and extending back down to the south. There is another tropical wave which is uh, currently moving through the windward and leeward islands, a weak wave which could bring some shower activity uh, back towards Haiti during the day tomorrow. Today's forecast though calling for a chance for an isolated shower. Temperatures should be in the lower 30s on the Celsius scale that's uh, in the lower 90s on the Fahrenheit scale. Ralph? Six astronauts in the Space Shuttle Discovery got a bonus day in space Sunday. The mission was able to conserve enough power to earn a tenth day to do extra scientific experiments. The crew was awakened Sunday with a Billy Joel song and the reminder that the shuttle had made 137 revolutions of the Earth. Sunday's activities include a study of space shuttle exhaust and a continuation of a meteorological study with lasers. The shuttle is now scheduled to land Monday afternoon. are not going to be allowed to land on schedule at about 2.30 Eastern time this afternoon. Mission controllers have just told them to stay in orbit for an extra 90 minutes. What that means is that the next possible time that the shuttle Discovery will come back to Earth will be 3.56 this afternoon. If they're not able to make that because of clouds, thunder, rain in the uh, area around the uh, Kennedy Space Center, they'll stay up in orbit for one more day. Again, not a problem. They have enough food and air to last for another day or two. Frank? John, what's happening? Well, Frank, there's been some bad weather near the shuttle landing strip in Florida. The astronauts had hoped they'd be able to come home this afternoon. Now NASA managers tell them, no, they're not going to be able to do that. So instead of having the shuttle all buttoned up and ready for a landing, they're reopening it so the radiators out in the back will keep the temperature and such correct. It appears now that the earliest the space shuttle will be able to land will be uh, 12 minutes after 2 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow and that would be at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. As you know, the weather in Florida in the afternoons in the summer and fall is always sort of iffy. There's some uh, thick cloud cover around the landing strip. Because the shuttle doesn't have engines on it, the astronauts feel that they have to land it uh, in clear weather, and they don't have clear weather, so they're going to stay up in orbit another day. John, are there any complications or any uh, challenges in associated with bringing the shuttle in a little late? The only real complication, Frank, is that the astronauts are going to go one more day without a shower. They have been complaining on their two-way radios for the past couple of days about the fact they've been there for 10 days. They have enough oxygen, enough air, enough food to stay up two additional days. So there's not a, a danger to the astronauts. It's just a matter of they, well, the pilot of the shuttle uh, said yesterday that he is getting very physically tired just from having to do all the work that they have been doing. And uh, everybody, uh, Susan Helms, the, uh, the only female astronaut on this mission says she needs to, to wash her hair really bad. That's the only problem here. Well, we'll get some extra water in the hot water tanks and let them have an extra <laughs> long shower when they get back. John Holloman, thanks very much. The shuttle is scheduled to end its mission in a short while, a day late because of poor weather. It's still unclear if the shuttle will land at Cape Canaveral in Florida or at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The crew completed many scientific tasks during the extended 11-day mission. Astronauts studied global climate with a $25 million laser and conducted the first untethered spacewalk in 10 years. When the shuttle's cleared for landing, CNN International will bring you the pictures live. A strong frontal system is pushing across western and central sections of Canada. The forecast calls for snow across Saskatchewan and into Manitoba. This system will bring much cooler weather to the eastern United States over the next uh, several days. Still wet over Florida, still warm across the western United States. We'll that erupted uh, on New Guinea near the uh, town of Rabaul. Now, this is on New Britain Island, and you can quite clearly see the eruption, and you can see the strong easterly winds blow the ash plume off to the west. 
very, very dangerous conditions. We're told that the ocean waters have been boiling. We'll have a complete world weather forecast within the hour. Looters are said to be moving in. More than 30,000 people were evacuated on Monday after the volcanoes began to spew volcanic ash and hot gases. Officials say two people have been killed in incidents related at least to the eruptions. But bad weather along the Florida coast has forced NASA to move the landing site from the Kennedy Space Center to California's Edwards Air Force Base. The first landing attempt at Edwards is about 90 minutes away. If that's a no-go, they'll try again about three hours from now. Whenever the shuttle lands, CNN will, of course, bring it to you live. More than 30,000 people have fled, some of them by boat, some to nearby villages. Relief efforts have begun for thousands of the evacuees. Many are feared missing under the thick layer of ash covering the area. The volcanoes have blanketed the area with massive amounts of gray ash. Some of it has been shot skyward to elevations of more than 19,000 meters. The space shuttle Discovery is scheduled to land at Edwards Air Force Base in California less than an hour from now. NASA scrapped two earlier attempts to land in Florida because of poor weather. Discovery's crew completed a number of scientific experiments during an 11-day mission. This is a special report from CNN International. Hello, I'm Jonathan Mann. We're breaking into our regular programming now to go live to the Edwards Air Force Base in California for the landing of the Space Shuttle Altitude. Discovery. The six astronauts on board have been in space 11 days now, traveled more than 7 million kilometers. They couldn't come home, though. Their landing was delayed twice by bad weather at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So instead, they are coming down in pretty well perfect weather in California. Just one hour ago, the shuttle was moving at a speed of more than 30,000 kilometers an hour. It has substantially slowed. Let's listen in now as the shuttle makes its way to the landing. Airspeed 300 knots. Altitude 600 feet. Landing gears down and locked. Main gear touchdown. Drag chute deploy. Nose gear touchdown. Discovery rolling out on runway 04 at Edwards Air Force Base, California. After 177 trips around the world in 11 days and four and a half million miles underneath the wings. There you have it, the Big Bird is back. The shuttle Discovery back on Earth at Edwards Air Force Base in California after 11 days in orbit. I'm Jonathan Mann. We return you now to World Business. This has been a special report from CNN International. Two volcanoes in Papua New Guinea erupted on Monday, creating a disastrous situation on the island of New Britain and possibly some global weather ramifications. Clouds of dust and ash climbed over a mile into the sky. Lightning created by the thick clouds struck and killed one man. Residents evacuated the island as the volcanoes continued to erupt on Tuesday and Wednesday. The massive clouds were even seen by the crew aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. Some scientists predict the dust and ash could lower temperatures on Earth in coming months by blocking sunlight. Papua New Guinea. Alle Straßen sind mit einer Meter dicken Schicht aus Asche bedeckt. Folgen der seit Tagen andauernden Vulkanausbrüche. Rund 100.000 Menschen mussten die Region verlassen, weil es weder Trinkwasser, Nahrungsmittel noch sichere Unterkünfte gibt. Nach Angaben des Nationalen Katastrophenkomitees ist ein Ende der Vulkanaktivitäten nicht in Sicht. Thousands of people in the path of an avalanche of mud flowing from the slopes of the volcano Mount Pinatubo. At least 23 people are known to have been killed and more than a thousand homes have been destroyed. Mark Orchard reports. Villagers pick through the remains of their homes. Everything they own has either been carried away or ruined by the mud. These, though, are the lucky ones. The death toll is still rising as rescue workers search the area. Mount Pinatubo is just visible in the distance, surrounded by millions of tons of volcanic ash deposited after its eruption three years ago. Ash that this year's annual rains have turned into a deadly avalanche of steaming mud. 
Since Friday, many villages in Pampanga province have been almost completely destroyed as the dikes built by residents to protect their homes gave way to the fast-moving mud flows. The Philippines Disaster Committee is coordinating the relief effort. They say as many as 60,000 people have been displaced. Many more are refusing to leave their homes, preferring to take their chances with the mud flows rather than move to one of the government-run emergency camps, which they claim are filthy and cramped. Local authorities have given the residents of two threatened villages until Monday to leave voluntarily. After that, they will evict them by force. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus three hours in holding. Approximately 25 and a half minutes remaining in this built-in hold. The uh, ice inspection team is currently documenting uh, what appears to be some light frost on uh, main engine number one, but uh, at this time, the, uh, the team does not appear to be too concerned about what they're seeing. It uh, is somewhat uh, moist today, so uh, there is a lot of humidity, and it's uh, quite possible with the super cold temperatures up around the uh, uh, upper portion of the main engines where the uh, temperatures are very, very cold that uh, some frost could form. We're going now to the astronaut quarter, to the suit-up room, where we see Commander Dick Richards being outfitted with his helmet, or a final check of his helmet. And all the crew now in their Dayglow Orange launch and entry suits. There's the pilot, uh, Blaine Hammond. Blaine Hammond, a uh, colonel in the Air Force, has been an astronaut since 1984. And flown uh, previously on STS-39, a uh, Department of Defense mission in 1991. He has 199 hours in space. There's uh, mission specialist Mark Lee. He'll be performing one of the, uh, he'll be one of the EVA crew members toward the end of this mission. He has 288 hours in space. There is Susan Helms. She is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force and has flown uh, previously on STS-54 on a uh, deployment of a tracking and data relay satellite. She has 143 hours in space and uh, is from Portland, Oregon. Carl Mead. Dr. Uh, Carl Mead has a, uh, an MD and a PhD. Practiced uh, medicine uh, in the medical, medical corps in the U.S. Navy. And there is uh, Jerry Leninger, our uh, medical corps uh, astronaut. He's from uh, Eastport or East Point, uh, Michigan and Coronado, California. This is shuttle launch control at T minus two hours, 55 minutes, 30 seconds and counting. And we see our STS-64 astronaut flight crew now headed down the corridor toward the elevator. In the operations and checkout building, some of the employees at the astronaut office uh, wishing them well. <laughs> Dick Richards, Blaine Hammond. Mark Lee, Jerry Leninger, Paul Mead, and Susan Helms. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus two hours, 45 minutes, 10 seconds, and counting. The Astro van now passing the vehicle assembly building, and the launch control center now immediately on the uh, left of the Astro van. Space shuttle launch director Bob Seek has just uh, called for the mission management team and Houston flight to gather on the weather channel here in about another five minutes or so for another assessment of our uh, launch conditions. We are still red for flight through clouds greater than 4,500 feet thick and for uh, flight through thunderstorm debris clouds. Looks like Space Flight Meteorology Group is going to give us a go if we can pick up right away. We are go for launch. Request we proceed immediately. I copy that. Can we start officer quarters, please, and also Oasis recorder? Wilco. 
Discovery OTC, close and lock your visors, initiate O2 flow, it's time to fly. All right, we, that's complete and we'll see you all in uh, about a week or so. Sound suppression system activated. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, main engine start, three engines up and burning, two, one, liftoff of Space Shuttle Discovery, developing new techniques to monitor our Earth's environment from space. Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Discovery. Houston now controlling. Discovery's rolling on course for a 57 degree inclination, 140 nautical mile high orbit on its 19th trip to space. Discovery speed already 400 miles an hour, altitude 9,000 feet. Three engines on board Discovery now throttling back to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure. Discovery now going supersonic. Speed now, 1,023 miles an hour, four miles east of the launch pad. Altitude is 47,000 feet. Discovery, go at throttle up. Go at throttle up. Three engines on board Discovery now back at full throttle. Good hydraulic systems, good electrical systems on board. One and a half minutes since liftoff. Discovery's already burned more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant and weighs less than half of what it did at launch. Flight controllers now be standing by for burnout and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Discovery's altitude now 108,000 feet, 16 miles east of the Kennedy Space Center. Speed now 2,700 miles an hour. Booster officer confirms a good separation and jettison of the twin solid rockets. Altitude now 167,000 feet, 32 miles east of the Kennedy Space Center. Discovery traveling 3,400 miles. Nominal. Nominal performance, Brent, and you're in the barrel again. Okay, Dick, we'll work on it. This is Mission Control Houston as uh, Discovery now passing above the Atlantic coast of Brazil uh, at an altitude of about 140 nautical miles with uh, Mission Specialist Susan Helms uh, continuing through a checkout of the mechanical arm. This checkout of the mechanical arm uh, puts its through its various uh, drive modes, uh, its primary and backup modes, and primary and backup uh, powering devices uh, to thoroughly check it out in preparation again for operations with the shuttle plume impingement flight experiment. One great picture discovery. Okay, we thought you'd enjoy that one. We'll go ahead and proceed. Sorry, that picture has to go away. Thanks a lot. You got a great looking payload bay there. Okay, this is position number 60. One day, 20 hours, 1942.
Robot arm operator uh, confirms that the uh, arm has now captured the area. Back on the flight deck, uh, the procedures are pres pressing on for the uh, uh, release of the Spartan satellite on time at about 4.30 this afternoon. And we're seeing the release now. Spartan's a 2,800 pound satellite. And shortly after the release, the uh, satellite on its own uh, began a uh, pre-programmed. It's a great release, Susan. Again, uh, shortly after the release, the satellite on its own uh, went through a pre-programmed series of pirouettes to ensure that it's a healthy spacecraft. Once those were completed, uh, that signaled uh, a healthy spacecraft and allowed the uh, Discovery's crew to slowly maneuver the orbiter away from the satellite to a point, uh, station keeping point, about 50 nautical miles or so away from the Spartan, where it will remain for about a 40 to 48 hour period of time prior to uh, rendezvousing and retrieving, capturing, and replacing this satellite back in the payload bay for the trip home. From this satellite on the sun's corona, and the solar wind will be uh, collected on board. Good morning, Space Shuttle Discovery. Right now, your light instrument is lazing, and we're collecting great atmospheric environmental data as we speak. And it's a great day for an untethered spacewalk in the payload bay. Discovery Houston, we see you on internal power for the EMUs. You have a go for EVA. At last, we can finally have access to the galley. <laughs> yeah, if there's no top you up to pudding when I come back, you're all in trouble. This is Mission Control Houston again, uh, Mission Specialist Mark Lee here, performing his first uh, calibration flight of the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, uh, box-shaped trajectory above the payload bay. And uh, from the looks of it, uh, James, it's working beautifully. You can see him control himself one axis at a time uh, in rotation and then a long one axis at a time in translation. And uh, it looks like a Olympic figure skater. It's so smooth.
waiting for Jerry. Go ahead, story. As you know, we need to cycle that valve and then vent it, sir. Was that a question or a statement? Yes, yeah, sir. Can you you want us to cycle the valve and vent? Is that what you'd like us to try again? Yes, you are. You're looking good. The process that uh, we see that will occur throughout this spacewalk is recharging the safer unit with gaseous nitrogen, which is used to propel the astronaut around the payload bay. There is a hose that's attached to that unit to recharge it, and that hose builds up pressure in it as well as the uh, backpack does. And before the hose is disconnected, it meets down, or the pressure needs to be relieved from that hose. All that appears to be uh, the problem there was it didn't. It required a little bit longer uh, time, about 30 seconds or so, to bleed the pressure down in that line before disconnecting it from the backpack. And Mark Lee is now on his way for the uh, uh, next step in the evaluation uh, of the SAFER unit. SAFER, again, standing for the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. Discovery is uh, just beginning the 109th orbit of the mission, uh, about to move from uh, daylight into darkness as it flies over uh, Europe on a northeasterly track, uh, getting ready to move across uh, Asia. Mark Lee uh, now translating using the uh, SAFER unit. He's untethered from the spacecraft. He'll be translating uh, along the left side of the payload bay back to the uh, 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 aft end of the payload bay. and then he will uh, turn around and uh, fly back to the forward bulkhead. This is part of the uh, system engineering evaluation. He'll fire the jets on the backpack for one second, and then he'll coast for about five seconds, and then uh, conduct a one second braking maneuver with the unit. Throughout the test, uh, the uh, backpack has a data recorder that will capture the information uh, during the performance evaluations. Watch your uh, pad back there, Carl. This is by Spartan. I'm on the commencing plus X now. That was filthy scary. <laughs> okay, here we go. 59 and 60. 
59 and 62. 59 and 62 and wait on the arm. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Carl Mead now set to uh, slowly uh, spin uh, Mark Lee once again. The first one was a little too fast, and the crew's comments uh, were evident of that. It was a nice roll, though. Beautiful discovery. Do you want to stop? So you can stop the arm. Carl Mead uh, mounted on the end of the shuttle's robot arm and Mark Lee free-flying using the safer unit in its automatic hold mode. Carl Mead is uh, slowly spinning him in various uh, different axes to uh, allow the attitude hold system to stabilize Mark Lee.
you can see Mark engage the attitude hold and he, it brings him right to a stop. It seems to be very uh, quick reacting. Okay, just for you guys' reference, I'm right at the top of the envelope now. Okay, and that looks about right from here too. I got 30 and 43, so I'm in good shape coming towards you. Run the arm all the way to the edge of the envelope. Arm down a roll still. With the attitude hold uh, engaged, uh, now the arm is uh, pulling away from Mark Lee, and he's demonstrating uh, the capability of flying across the payload bay almost from uh, one wing to the other. Susan Helms uh, now slowly lowering the two astronauts back down into the payload bay. The views uh, from the payload bay as uh, Discovery moves into sunrise, uh, crossing the southern Pacific Ocean, beginning a northeasterly track. In step 16, vent the GN2 until the reg pressure is less than 50. And then you'll press on from there. And what that'll do will seal off the lines going to the orbiter. Step 20, in order to set up safer for the next recharge, depressurize, depress the lock button and rotate the coupler clockwise to the open to flow position on the QD attached to the SRS and reattach the TMG. Uh, yes, toggle valve closed. My toggle valve closed, okay. And access the quick disconnect coupler and attach the SRS. Okay, Mark, I'm going to raise your feet a little bit. Let's have just go out over there. Depress the lock button counterclockwise 270 degrees to the close to flow position. Mark Lee uh, now with a recharged backpack uh, on his way for the uh, final evaluation and uh, his assessment of the uh, safer unit. This is a fight, flight uh, qualification uh, evaluation or a flight quality evaluation. He will assess uh, how precisely he can maneuver with the safer unit following the path uh, of the robot arm. This is, again, an evaluation to determine how precise this uh, safer unit can fly. Okay, Stuart, I'm calling it stable at 45%. Copy, Mark. This uh, final uh, evaluation for Mark Lee is uh, uh, one of the most important points during the SAFER evaluation to uh, uh, ensure that free-flying free astronauts can maneuver in uh, very tight spaces as uh, may be required around a future International Space Station. Yeah, 
We missed that on the recorder, Mark. Then we got away. Got it, thanks. Great view of the elbow camera down here. What about the B cam or the Bravo camera? We have both great views, Mark. mentioned uh, the Air Force earlier, the only comment that I've got is I'd like to say hello to all of my classmates at the 20th reunion at the Air Force Academy. I wish I could be there, but as you see, someone's got to fly high cover for all of you. Well, I think I'm staying exactly where I want to be, so this is, this is working really good. Looking great from in here, Mark. Throughout the uh, evaluation, Mark Lee uh, will be heard reading numbers, uh, basically giving uh, uh, remaining uh, nitrogen available in the safer unit, and the reports from uh, EVA officer Sue Rainwater here in Mission Control are that uh, he's actually using less nitrogen for this process than was uh, trained for. Uh, the battery power usage is about right on the money as to what the predicteds were pre-flight.
35 and 21. Copy. And Mark Lee uh, now very carefully rounding the corner, uh, the elbow position on the robot arm, making the final uh, turn, uh, coming back, headed down toward the payload bay. I don't think I'm going to get it. The sun's not right. And Kyle, looking at the picture, you can see how relatively easy it seems to be to fly. He can take his, his hand off the controller. And the motion continues in a very smooth way. It's like t a bit like taking your hand off the steering wheel. In this case, uh, it, it, the uh, motion proceeds straight ahead, very smooth. I'm going to skip the tether. Put it back off here and take a. And Joe, did you get the same sense when you flew the MMU of of having uh, uh, command over that unit, feeling the full control over the maneuverability, like uh, it appears that Mark Lee is having here? Uh, absolutely, it's quite, it's it's easy to con control in a very precise way. It's a considerably more complicated than this in that you're controlling both the rotation and the translation at the same time. I say complicated; it's more versatile. Uh, one couldn't move this uh, in s in such a rapid way with a lot of motions uh, all at once. But because this is a safe de a safing device, you don't need that complexity here. As we look at the TV picture, it's very easy to see a Carl making inputs into the hand controller. And you can then uh, pretty much see with your, your own eyes that the unit reacts. In other words, he moves once the input goes in. It's very slow, very deliberate, almost dreamlike. And Joe, we were talking just a minute ago about uh, uh, whether or not you had conversations with uh, your uh, co-flyer on your spacewalk, Dale Gardner, after your EVA because he was going to go out the next day and do the same thing and you were commenting that you really didn't debrief that much because it flew so well uh, and you were relating that to what they're doing here. Uh, yes, uh, because Mark and Carl have not been talking about how it flies differently than they expected. I think we can almost presume that it's flying pretty much the way their simulators and trainers had indicated it would. You can see clearly the uh, pluming of the control thrusters uh, pluming the tether from time to time. The tether will bounce, and that's the, the uh, gaseous nitrogen being jetted out of the controlling devices that Carl is using to move himself around with.
Carl Mead has uh, completed a rotation evaluation. Uh, he's already done a translation back to the uh, uh, rear part of the payload bay. He's now completed a rotation evaluation and then now will uh, maneuver back to the forward bulkhead of the orbiter. Discovery is uh, tracking northeast across the Pacific Ocean on the la latter portions of orbit 110. And Kyle, we can see uh, three satellites in this picture. There's this, the satellite Discovery, the, the satellite Planet Earth, satellite of the Sun, and satellite Carl Mead. Susan Helms uh, maneuvering the arm now to allow Mark Lee to climb into the uh, portable foot restraint attachment device, which is located uh, on the uh, tip of the robot arm. Baseball going on, Carl. I guess I'll have to catch you. Huh? I guess so. Hey, Josh. Oh. All right, we're back. 
Dispatch, you can go back to rescue demo position. All right, I'm on move. 22-0-6. Again, this is an evaluation of the attitude control system uh, on the SAFER unit and its ability to uh, provide a, uh, uh, itself as a rescue device. Once Mark Lee uh, releases Carl Mead and, and puts him into a gentle spin, uh, the arm is backed away and uh, Carl Mead is uh, supposed to fly the safer unit back to his, uh, his uh, co-worker on the end of the robot arm. The uh, two astronauts using uh, lights on their helmets now as the orbiter moves into darkness. The last of the uh, rescue demonstration uh, sequences had uh, Mark Lee spin Carl Mead in a multi-axis rotation. Then uh, Susan Helms slowly moves the robot arm uh, across the orbiter while uh, Mark Lee flies the safer almost from wing to wing. Again, to demonstrate the capabilities of the uh, SAFER unit uh, as a rescue device should an astronaut become untethered uh, from uh, uh, which is just approaching the five-hour mark. suggest you start your precision approach from your present position. Okay, we'll do that. 
Those words to Carl Mead are that uh, the battery power is getting a little low, and so uh, instead of following that profile back down to the shoulder joint, uh, he's going to go ahead and fly the precision approach to the aft flight deck windows of the orbiter. Clearly in view is the uh, primary payload on the mission, the LIDAR in space technology experiment uh, housed in the forward portion of Discovery's payload bay. And Kyle, we can see on his, his forearm there, the electronic checklist that uh, he's been evaluating or will evalu evaluate. The other checklist, more normal, the one I was used to is, is on his other arm and you see the pages of it flapping in the breeze from time to time. Yeah, I remember a little while ago we were uh, noticing, or you were noticing, that the uh, actually the jet firings on the jet, uh, backpack were uh, fluttering the, the uh, paper checklist on his other arm. Guidance, navigation, and control officer reports. Commander Dick Richards is now manually flying the spacecraft as it can begins its turn around the heading alignment cylinder, again an imaginary cylinder around which it will fly a 330 degree left turn to align with runway 04. Cylinder created by the microwave scan beam landing system in place at Edwards Air Force Base. Discovery's altitude, 30,000 feet. Discovery Houston, we show you slightly low at the 180. Roger that. Commander Dick Ridge, Richards continuing a right turn around the heading alignment cylinder created by the microwave scan beam landing system at Edwards. Altitude is now 22,000 feet. Discovery on energy at the 90. Call indicating that Discovery is uh, right on course and on track uh, for its touchdown. Touchdown is now about two minutes away. Discovery's altitude 18,000 feet. Airspeed 260 knots. Discovery completing a left turn to align with runway 04. Discovery now. Discovery now aligning with the center line, performing a subsonic maneuver test as part of a test objective on the mission. Altitude 6,500 feet. Discovery on glide slope on center line. Winds are now 070 at 4 peak 10. All indicating Discovery's descent is right on target, and Commander Dick Richards is aligned with the center of runway 04, altitude 3,000 feet. Airspeed 300 knots. Altitude 600 feet. Landing gears down and locked.
main gear touchdown. Drag chute deploy. Nose gear touchdown. Discovery rolling out on runway 04 at Edwards Air Force Base, California after 177 trips around the world in 11 days and four and a half million miles underneath the wings.